Hello, YouTubers. Nice to see you again. I've had a bit of a break from YouTube, not watching, but from creating content. But uh, now it's time for another video. And I thought about a very interesting thing. Today, or this year rather, 2019, there's been lots of talk about a year that occurred 50 years ago. And even more so, all the albums that were released back then. This year we've seen so many 50th anniversary reissues, often very luxurious. If you want to keep up with them, buy all of them, you need a quite a big wallet. And also, in many cases, you need quite a big wallet to get hold of the original ones. Um, I had a look in my record collection to see how many of these or how many albums from 1969 that I had and I realized I've got quite a few and uh, I thought well why not have a look at uh, well, those that at least I think um, uh, are very good and maybe have a bit of a month to month look at them right so that's what this video is about the thing that's so special about 1969 uh, and this video rather is that the fact that there were so many great albums, legendary albums, that people still talk about today, that people still play today, that people still are influenced by to this date. And that's quite something. Uh, and uh, I think it's time to start with January 1969. And now we're not talking about recording dates, because they, of course, in most cases, were done much earlier than in the actual month uh, that I'm talking about. I'm talking about the release date, and of course that can vary a bit too. But uh, these are the release dates uh, dates that I got from the Wikipedia articles and also from Discogs. So let's go with that. And I'm not. I'm just talking about months, not actual dates, because that can be a bit different too. These would be my picks for January. 1969 and let's start with one of the great debut albums Led Zeppelin well you've seen this before I'm sure we've seen it many times and we'll listen to it many times and it's still a masterpiece this is one of the reissues uh, from the maybe four or five years ago uh, the remastered I had Actually, uh, uh, some sort of a um, fake original issue, you know, the one with the turquoise lettering. Uh, and when I showed it in a video, I didn't know that the turquoise lettering was so exciting to many collectors. So uh, they, I got some really excited comments about it. So I learned a bit new, a bit, learned a bit of, uh, about that by checking out why. Uh, it was so special with turquoise lettering. My copy, though, was a bit of a fake later issue, but it sounded well. And this is, sounds even better. I mean, it starts great from the very start, with good times, bad times, and so on. It's not my favorite Led Zeppelin album, but it's a great one. It's, an, it's a great debut. The next album is not a debut. But it's the first of three albums that were issued in 1969. Three albums, imagine that. Uh, and I'm talking about Bayou Country by Credence Clearwater Revival. It was issued in January 69, according to my sources. Uh, and it has the most famous song, is probably Proud Mary. Um, I love Creedence Clearwater Revival, although I have to say that I've always viewed them more as a singles band. Um, I don't, 
I don't really listen that often to their albums, uh, even if they are good, but often they are a bit uneven. But, I mean, Creedence Clearwater Revival is Creedence Clearwater Revival. I tried to say that uh, fast ten times. Um, um, maybe, but sometimes I wonder, what if they made one real big 1969 album with all their big hits and, oh, well, what about you? Yeah. One should not never one should never try to change the past. So let's skip on that. Okay. Um the third 1969 album that I'm going to show oh, so January 69 album that I would like to show is Blood, Sweat and Tears. It's their second album. Uh, and uh, um it is the first with David Clayton Thomas. I know that David Clayton Thomas is not Everybody's favorite singer in Blood, Sweat and Tears, but he's mine. I've always liked his voice. And this is like a very steady album that holds well. Uh, yeah, I mean, some people think their debut album is greater. That's a great album too. But this is closer to me because this is probably the first one I heard. Uh, with starting with and ending with variations on... The, on um, uh, theme by Eric Satie. Eric Satie is one of my favorite classical composers. And God Bless the Child. And uh, You Made Me So Very Happy. Spinning Wheel. Simple, but very effective. Yeah, so. Another good one from 1969, uh, January. If we move on to February, I don't have that many albums that I would like to hold up it uh, and also there are, I'm sure there were many albums that were great issue that month but I don't have any of them but this is Beach Boys 2020 probably not their most famous album but um, I I like this album for one big reason because one of my absolute favorite tracks with them uh, can be found on this album. It's I Can Hear Music, originally recorded by the Ronettes, but in the definite version of this album with uh, Carl Wilson on lead vocals. Really great. So, another good one from 1969, February. What about March 1969? Well, we have probably... Uh, one of the most highly regarded Bee Gees albums. I'm not a fan of Bee Gees, although I like some of the material they did back in the late 60s and early 70s, before they all turned. Oh, 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 staying alive. Yeah, but this one is um, from 1969. It was issued in uh, March 1969, and it's Odessa. This is a German reissue on the Carousel Gold Serie. So it's not the original one, but it's a double, al uh, double album. It's really, really good. This is Bee Gees at their best, in my opinion, anyway. The Birds also issued an album. Mm, it's not one of those that people talk about that much. But uh, still quite good one. The Birds and Mr. Hyde. I got the impression that the Birds were mainly fighting back uh, during these days. Or and, well, before and later as well. Because they constantly changed their lineup. Uh, this one is uh, it's the one that starts with This Wheel's on Fire. Um, and uh, not sure if they had any real hits. From this, mm, no, not really. Produced by Bob Johnson, Johnston, uh, and issued in March 1969. Not one of my favorite ones, but still I like it. Uh, but then we have a really legendary album, and it's Dusty Springfield's most famous album, "Dusty in Memphis," recorded in the American Sound Studios in Memphis. Um, uh, and of course we got Son of a Preacher Man and many other great songs. Uh, I think mostly, I mean, okay, 
Dusty Springfield's a great singer, but what I particularly like even more is the, the musical talent of the um, studio musicians that uh, were recording at the American Sound Studios. And we'll get back to another very famous 1969 album that was recorded in the very same studio later in this um, calendar of 1969 vinyl issues. I think you have, most of you already know which album I'm talking about. Still, <coughs> I've heard that, was it Aretha Franklin that wasn't too impressed by Dusty Springfield, thinking that she was a bit of a hmm, imitator here. And didn't she say something like, if I had coughed on the original recording, Dusty would have coughed on her as well? Or was it sneezed? Hmm, not sure. Well, Dusty Springfield was a great singer and uh, I think this is her finest moment in the recording studio. Uh, all right, but uh, let's move on to April. I only have one from April, but it was an album that caused some confusion, uh, to say the least, especially among his big fans. Yeah, you know which one I'm talking about. Nashville Skyline, Bob Dylan. The whole first, the folk singer, protest singer, uh, folk rock, uh, star uh, then suddenly dropped his uh, uh, his old vocal or his old voice and started to sing with a very soft voice singing country and western and of course everybody listened to bob dylan and everybody followed well well quite a lot of artists and groups groups followed in his footsteps to say the least so <clears throat> Nashville skyline from 1969 uh, it's not one of my favorite Bob Dylan albums but unlike some so-called Dylan fans I don't hate it actually I think it's very nice um, especially I threw it all away um, and uh, tonight I'll be staying here with you it's really good country. Bob Dylan shows here that he understood country, even though many people thought that, well, well, the, some of the country people thought, even thought, even thought, oh, I would guess, um, is he ridiculing us? But he didn't. Bob Dylan's a great music lover of many different sorts of music. Uh, all right, uh, so that was April 1969. Right. May 1969, well, let's start by uh, having a look at Booker T and the MGs. The Booker T and the MGs is the Booker set on the Stax label. I don't have to introduce the Booker T and the MGs to you. It's one of my favorite groups. And this is actually the first album that I bought, on vinyl that is, because I'd kn known about them quite a lot. and. I've had uh, CDs transferred to cassettes and uh, yeah and so on but this was the first vinyl album that I got a hold of and I got a hold of it in Lulio back in the 1990s and I was happy as a child when I got it and it's well for that reason it's one of the, the their albums that I like the most um, especially I mean the starting a startup track, the first track, the horse. Wow. You really get the groove there and I mean Booker T and the MGs were rarely well they were never bad and they were rarely uninteresting. So um, this is great album and it was as I said issued in May 1969. Another famous album that people probably have talked a bit more about during the years is The Who, Tommy, uh, and well, sort of musical that has uh, survived quite well during the years, an ambitious project back then, um, and The Who were involved in many ambitious projects, even if they were more a bit of a, quite, well, a little bit of a garage band in the early days, but they developed and became a really, really 
heavy rock band uh, with really great songwriting and great musicianships. Um, I'm not a diehard The Who fan, but I mean, you have to really like these uh, uh, these ones from the uh, mid to late 60s, well, even some, some of the 70s uh, issues. I'm quite fond of The Who by numbers as well. But Tommy, also issued in May 1969. Uh, Neil Young and Crazy Horse. Everybody knows this is nowhere. Um, not sure was it his debut. Uh, mm, should have checked this <laughs> before uh, before I started this video. But never mind. Uh, great album, even though uh, the um, more into his uh, Harvest and also Harvest Moon uh, and of the Beach. Well, there are many great Neil Young albums, and this was a. Nice start, even if it's not one of my favorites. Uh, let's have a look at The Hollies as well. They issued The Hollies Sing Dylan. The Hollies were very fav uh, very popular here in Sweden, and they also had a Swedish singer during a couple of years, Mikael Rikfors, in the early 70s. Uh, <coughs> but, uh, this is, uh, of course, um, just Bob Dylan songs and as I said who weren't influenced by Bob Dylan back then in the 1960s very few I tell you maybe not Mantovani but hmm, not sure about that <laughs> there may be a Mantovani plays Dylan album somewhere <laughs> actually um, great album maybe not their best or most interesting but still a great album June 1969 was a great month. Two of the most important albums to me when I grew up were issued in June 1969. But I'll first show some others. Uh, some other really great albums that I have in my collection, but I have discovered those later. Jeff Beck. Beckola. Uh, or Jeff Beck group, Cosa Nostra and Beck Ola with his apple on the sleeve. Uh, I first uh, had this on a CD back in, I think, 90s, early 2000s. Then I got hold of this. Well, it is a reissue, but it's still a great album. And I'm a great fan of Jeff Beck and his guitar master mastership. Another uh, great album, Deep Purple, titled Deep Purple, not their first album, but one of their great ones, the early days on the Harvest label, superb, and we have a, a debutante recording, well, I, I almost said using his own name, but <laughs> that's what it didn't do, but Mr. Reginald White became Elton John and recorded his first album, Empty Sky, that was issued in June 1969 of the DJM label. Uh, I think it's alright, although he would. It's an alright right debut, but he would make lots of greater stuff when the 60s turned into the early 70s. Another debutant uh, on vinyl, on album, vinyl, made his first uh, vinyl album in June 1969, was the great singer Roberta Flack. First take on Atlantic Records. Uh, her Killing Me Softly album was also one of my most uh, valued albums when I was a kid. Of course, part of my mother's record collection, played it many times, fell in love with it and have worn out a couple of copies of it. Um, this is uh, uh, the first album from 1969, Les McCann presents Roberta Flack, first take, meeting reaction and result. It's a great debut, uh, great debut, and uh, uh, but 
I think her later albums will be even better. Even, I mean, her there are some amazing versions of Hey, That's No Way To Say Goodbye and the big hit, The First Time Ever I Saw Your Face by Evan McCall. Great stuff. Okay. Time for the two albums that were part of my childhood, of my musical upbringing, and who, in my book, are iconic albums. To me, they are iconic. To many others as well. First, Elvis Presley from Elvis in Memphis. I've talked a lot about Elvis in my channel and I'm doing it here as well. Uh, and I've talked about this album so many times. And this was issued in June 1969, 50 years ago. And I mean, the, the albums recorded in the American Sound Studios. Those of you who heard me talk about Dusty Springfield, you knew already that this album was the one I was referring to, of course. Uh, I mean, the contents, the songs, the recordings, the performance of Elvis himself, and the sleeve with the Hogstrom Viking uh, guitar, who many years later inspired me to get my own Hogstrom Viking guitar. I mean, oh, I will always love this album. Always, always, always. And I've done so since, uh, well, I can't even remember the first time I heard it. So that's, uh, that's how long that has been part of my life. And the same is to be said with Johnny Cash as San Quentin. We have at Folsom Prison there at the wall, who we recorded the year before. But this one was one that was part of my home, my mother's record collection, and I listened to it. Uh, back then, before I understood English, I couldn't understand why there were beeps here and there when Johnny Cash talked. I didn't, I didn't understand what he said either because I didn't understand English. But still, I, I, sometimes when he talked, there were beeps. Couldn't understand that at all. Today, I can understand it. Uh, my favorite track is Wreck of the Old 97, a real... <sighs> Well, country speed metal version of that old 1920s, I think, song. It was Vernon Dalhart who made it back in the 1920s. But, uh, and uh, Johnny Cash also recorded it uh, earlier on one of his studio albums. But this is the version that I really like when he, uh, Yeah, especially when we come to the guitars. Oh, I shouldn't talk that much about this because... This video would go on forever then. <laughs> it would already be very, very, very long. So, um, yeah. Another iconic album for me and probably my favorite Johnny Cash album. At San Quentin. I ate every inch of you. No, no. Let's move on. July was a bit of a calmer month when it comes to legendary um, releases but I could show you two albums uh, from that year that I'm very fond of. First of all it's the only album recorded by the supergroup Blind Faith. Well, <clears throat> For reasons you may be aware of I'm going to show you the back sleeve just to be on the safe side. I'm not too keen on, on the front sleeve but uh, well it's that black thing made of vinyl inside the sleeve that matters, and I'm very fond of that. Uh, well, over to another group. Um, that, well, I think this is their second album. I'm talking about Jethro Tull and uh, the, their album Stand Up. I have no problem showing this sleeve because I think it's really cool. Uh, well, not just this, but also this. The album cover that stands up. And well, the Jethro tell they have many interesting, great ideas when it comes to record sleeves. 
No doubt about that. Just think of thick as a brick. That would come a couple of years later. Uh, another great album, Jethro Tal. And that was in July. Uh, August then. Well, we have already talked about Creedence Clearwater Revival and uh, Green River was issued in August 69. What's the most famous track here? Oh, small printing. Well, Bad Moon Rising for once. Uh, Commotion, Green River, Lodi, or is it Lodi? I forgot. Another great album, even as I said, I like more. Uh, I like them more as a singles band. Uh, the great group, Ten Years After. Uh, I think not enough talking about them these days. Uh, of course, they're not forgotten, but I think they are on par with many of those groups that are uh, constantly raised to the skies these days. They issue the album Shh this month. This is a Derham London issue, uh, but in my book, the most interesting album of uh, August 1969, it's a Swedish album, and a Swedish album that's very famous here in Sweden, and also um, an album that has lots of people talk about and still talk very warmly about. It is considered the first Swedish language rock album. Not sure if that is the case, but it's, it's without doubt the first Swedish language psychedelic rock album. And it is the debut album of Pug Rogefelt. Ja, det är det. Pug Rogefelt would have a long career and, well, he's still alive, so I won't say it has ended. Uh, with lots of many interesting records, not all of them that brilliant, but this is how it started. He had some song ideas, some song sketches, and the the um, man on Metronome Records, a man behind it, Anders Burman, teamed him up with the great guitar hero uh, Joje Vadenius well, bass and guitar hero from Main Sweden, and the jazz drummer Janne Karlsson, who would later become very popular, very famous and loved, also as an actor and entertainer, Janne Loffe Karlsson. And what they created is magic. I heard about this album when, well, when I was a kid, and I was very curious on it. But back in the 80s, this wasn't that easy to get hold of. Uh, on vinyl at least, well, also maybe I didn't look enough, but when it was issued in on CD back in 1990, I had just started buying CDs then, I bought this on CD, and wow, for the first time I heard it, I must have been 16 or 17 years old, and I thought, wow, this is really trippy, <laughs> uh, but I loved it from the start, and uh, I think it still holds up as a great, superb album. One of the best Swedish albums of all time. Pugge Rogefelt. Ja, det är det. Or Pug. This was actually issued in America as, as well. Uh, on Vault Records. My friend Falkis, 1984, has a copy of that American issue. And uh, I'm a bit jealous. Still, if you find this... Listen to it and treasure it. Those of you out there, even if you don't understand the Swedish lyrics, I think you'll, uh, you will understand the music and the groove. September 1969. What a great month. I mean, first, I got them all, Cosmic Blues. Again, Mama by Janis Joplin, a real masterpiece, even though I think the posthumous pearl is even better, but I mean, Janis Joplin's voice, amazing, 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 so great. I remember when I first heard Janis Joplin's voice, 
It was my babysitter who played one of her records to me and I was scared stiff. I've never heard anybody sing like that before. This was well, I must have been nine or ten years old, so I was actually scared stiff. <laughs> but later, when I've returned, I've really, really grown to love this voice and her artistry. She was amazing. Speaking about amazing, two of the greatest albums of all time in my book, in many others' book, in many others' books were issued in September 1969. First of all, The Band. The Brown Album, or just The Band. This is... I mean, this is flawless. I'm, I, uh, those of you who know me, you know what a great The Band fan I am. And I've been that since my late 20s when I finally started listening to them. Thanks to a cover that uh, I heard by one, of one of their songs sung by the then very young and talented, well, still, she's still talented, uh, Nora Jones. So I thought, well, this was a heck of a good song. Need to listen more. So I did. And I fell in love. And for a couple of years, in my late 20s, early 30s, it was all about the band, and I'm still a great fan of them. And this is my favorite album by them. I think many agree that it is the best one. And then, what was issued? Oh, let's see now. September 26, uh, 1969. Well... I think those of you with a clear memory, you remember, or you can remember all the talk about the 50th anniversary of Ta -da! Abbey Road. Well, being the great Beatles fan as well, this is also a highly revered album in my collection. I got several copies, several different issues. This is, I think this is the one that's closest to the original. Not sure, but I think so. Uh, uh, well, can't say anything more that has already been said about uh, Abbey Road. I've been talking about it earlier in this in this uh, channel as well, um, and it, I don't think even that it's their best one, but I still rate it as a big masterpiece. September nineteen sixty nine. Imagine growing up, following all the pop music. In 1969. Sometimes I really envy my mother. She was born in 1954. In 1969 she was 15 years old. It must have been amazing being a 15 year old pop and rock fan back in 1969. I think maybe some of the older viewers here might be able to hmm, agree with that. All right, that was September. But what about October. Well, do you remember what we talked about in the uh, beginning of this video? We talked about Led Zeppelin. They had issued their first album in th this month, in October. Time for the second one. And it's also a masterpiece. Uh, like all their early ones, actually. So, another masterpiece from 1969, I mean. How can you issue so many masterpieces in one year? It was an amazing music year. And then, oh, I'm not going to take it in that order. We have the concept album, Arthur, from the Kinks, the Davis Brothers. Well, the Kinks, they were also very popular here in Sweden. I may prefer their earlier stuff, um, not that much into concept albums as such, although it is really great, but not as great as uh, the record that I'm showing now. In the Court of Crimson King. In the Court of the, of the Crimson King, yeah. By an observation by King Crimson. 
Well, this is where progressive rock started in my book. And uh, it's so good. I can listen to it over and over again. Often when I travel to and from work, this is one of the albums I listen to most often because it's just amazing. And it's from 1969. It sounds much, much, much newer. And I have, I'm very happy to say that it is being discovered by the younger generations as well. I have even students who have talked about in the court of the Crimson King. Students, teenage students. That's amazing. And I'm so happy. I'm so happy about that. The knowledge about great music keeps living on. I mean, great music hopefully will never die. The camera has uh, recognized my face here when I record. That's fun, fun. It doesn't recognize this face though. Let's see. If I hold it back, maybe. No. <laughs> it's too gruesome, probably. Well, I'm glad it recognized my face as a face. Okay. We're getting close to the end of this amazing year, but we have November no, 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 no. we have November and December still to talk about. I picked out three albums for November. And uh, well, back to Credence. They had a very productive year in 1969. Will of the Poor Boys. Uh, one of my favorite albums, by the way, by the Credence. Uh, probably because it's one of those that I heard first, back when I was young. Uh, then, a really big breakthrough album. Not his first one though, but the big breakthrough. David Bowie, Space Oddity. And I mean, it wasn't his first album, but it was the one that really took off to an amazing career, especially in the 1970s. Well, that whole decade by uh, Bowie was amazing. And I think this is a, this is their debut album, yeah? The Ormond Brothers Band, who would also create lots of magic in the 1970s, even if their big star, Dwayne Ormond, died so early and tragically uh, that was November finally uh, Deep Purple again recorded uh, in live concert at the Royal Albert Hall concerto for group and orchestra composed by John Lord uh, together with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra conducted by Malcolm Arnold I mean this was like John Lord's big project, uh, uh, but this was also a time where it was more and more popular to start mixing classical music with pop music and rock music, like Exception. Oh, I could have picked that one as well. <laughs> Exception from Holland it was another album that I listened to a lot as a kid. They made their first album in 1969 as well. So, but anyway. Uh, Folk Rock Legends, Fairport Convention, they issued Liege and Leaf, not sure if I pronounced that right, but also great album, with the oh so great um, Sandy Denny, I'm getting old, I lost her name, Sandy Denny uh, on the vocals, I love the Sandy Denny Fairport Convention albums, there weren't that many, there could have been more. They could have, or they should have been many more Sandy Denny uh, albums, but passed away way too early. All right. Okay. Time to pick up probably my favorite Rolling Stones album, Let It Bleed. It was issued in December 1969. This is... I'm not sure really why I love this album so much, but when I first, I think it just, it attracts my musical taste. 
you got all the elements of a little bit of a country, a bit of a rock, a bit of a lots of roots, not that incredibly psychedelic and so on, and some really great songs and a very inspired group. This is my favorite Rolling Stones album. And the last album in this video is another Swedish one. And it's a children's album, but it's probably the grooviest children's album ever made in any country. Bold statement, but I've never heard anything that has been that groovy that's aimed for children. Guda Guda, Joje Vadenius from uh, Main in Sweden that we talked about earlier when we talked about the uh, Pugrogefelt album. He was on that one. And this is where he took uh, lyrics by the chil uh, children author, Barbro Lindgren, set them to music and recorded them. And oh, this is one of those albums that you just get in a good mood to listen to, even as an old adult, as an old fart as I am today. So that's it. 1969. What an amazing music year. I wonder if people in the year of 2069 we may, will make a similar uh, video about the music year of 2019. Somehow I doubt it. But who knows? This has been an incredibly long video. So thanks to those who managed to stay the whole video and check everything out. Sorry for my waffling, but after all, I've been away for two months now. I haven't made any videos since early August. Uh, but great to be back. Great to talk to you again. And uh, thank you very much for watching and hope to see you soon again. Play record.